Hello and welcome to another episode of Amazon Unfiltered. Today we have Mike Begg on the show. Mike is the co-founder of AMZ Advisors. They've done over 500 million in sales on Amazon through their clients. And I'm super excited to have him on today. Thank you for joining us. Saif, thank you for having me here. I'm excited to be speaking with you today and you know, tell you a little bit about e-commerce in Latin America. Perfect. So the topic for today's episode is expanding into Latin America. I see you have a business helping U.S.-based sellers expand into Latin America. And since the U.S. has become more competitive over the years, a lot of people are considering expanding into other countries. So maybe we can just start with like a general question and you can kind of explain to us why businesses in the U.S. should consider expanding there. Of course, uh, there's a lot of different reasons to consider Latin America as the next markets that you want to go into. Uh, first and foremost, the Latin American markets for e-commerce do between uh, the estimates between 150 and 350 billion dollars per year in sales, which is pretty significant. Uh, Amazon alone in these platform in these uh, countries account for about 50 percent of the sales. So there's a pretty significant uh, opportunity to capture a lot of sales there. Uh, another reason is that in Latin America, specifically Mexico, uh, the middle class is growing quite rapidly. Uh, if we look at worldwide household income changes over the past year in 2022, Latin America grew uh, 20%. Pretty much every other region around the world contracted when it comes to household wealth. So there's a lot more people here that are interested in buying products now uh, than there have been in the past. And, and another great reason is that there's a lot of preference in Latin America for foreign brands. So uh, Brazil, about 40% uh, of consumers prefer buying foreign brands. In Mexico, there's a term called malinchismo, which essentially means that uh, it's the perception that products made here in Mexico are cheap or of not good quality. So they prefer purchasing foreign brands. So I think those are all great reasons on why foreign brands should consider selling in Latin America. Yeah, no, that that is a lot bigger than I first assumed, because I think the total GMV on Amazon US as of 2022 is like 400 billion. So if Latin America is like 150, 175, you know, it's, that's pretty big, actually. So it's, it's quite a big opportunity. So I guess, how do you, I guess, get into Latin America or what, what are the different options for fulfillment? So most Amazon sellers consider doing the North American Remote Fulfillment Program or NARF. Uh, the other option is obviously drop shipping as a uh, merchant fulfilled order from your own warehouse. But both of those programs or both of those options have significant problems. Uh, first and foremost, NARF is really, NARF or drop shipping is a really terrible customer experience for some a buyer here in Latin America. I live in Mexico, so I experience this every time I buy something on Amazon. Your products are going to be tagged with an importation tag, meaning that uh, the consumer knows that the product is not within Mexico. And because of that, there's going to be additional costs and tariffs that come with bringing the product into Mexico. So, uh, for example, I have purchased uh, computer monitors for my employees here in Mexico. It's at one price. But after I went to go pay, I was charged almost 100 percent more in additional fees that Amazon held on to and didn't tell me at checkout. So uh, it's a really terrible customer experience when you do the NARF program. Now, a lot of people will see sales through that, but what we really rec recommend is finding a local distributor or starting a business here. Uh, there's uh, Starting a business comes with a whole different range of challenges, but the easiest way is finding a local distributor. Uh, they'll be able to get your products not only onto Amazon, they'll be able to get them onto Mercado uh, Libre, onto Walmart, and many of the other e-commerce platforms that exist in Latin America as well as be able to get the products into uh, you know, Amazon fulfillment centers if you want and uh, Mercado, Mercado Libre fulfillment and any other fulfillment network in these countries. So uh, I would recommend staying away from NARF, staying away from drop shipping and focusing more on working with someone in country to get your products out there. Right. And how would someone go about finding that person or do they just set up on their own as their own distributor? When it comes to starting your own business in Mexico, uh, specifically, uh, you're looking at anywhere from four to six months to get a business up and running. You also need a Mexican business partner with some other challenges, uh, including dealing with language differences, legal system differences. Uh, those are probably a lot of reasons that you may want to consider working with a distributor instead. Uh, Brazil is even longer. Brazil, you're looking at 12 to 18 months to start a business. So that's uh, a significant hurdle as well. 
Um, if you're going to find a distributor, there's plenty of them out there. Uh, my, I have a company that does distribute products in Latin America for brands. So I'm glad to work with you as well. Uh, it's more about just seeing what your options are online. Yeah, no, it sounds pretty. So I think I, uh, registered my us and canada corporations like a month maximum the entire application process took like an hour or two for both so it sounds pretty ridiculous but yeah um i guess like what marketplaces then are you guys expanding to so we we will help brands expand to the three largest marketplaces so i mentioned the size of the latin american market uh brazil is the largest marketplace mexico is the second largest and colombia is the third largest uh, and Colombia is still significantly smaller than Mexico and Brazil. So we recommend starting with those two marketplaces. Uh, most sellers, we usually push to Mexico first because Mexico is typically an easier hurdle for them to get over. Uh, we have trade agreements with the, with, uh, between Mexico and the U S uh, it makes it easier to bring products in, uh, the proximity between the U S also makes it easier. And the logistics are a lot simpler because products can just be trucked over the border versus Brazil where things need to be shipped or flown in. And it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so from that standpoint, we always recommend Mexico first, then Brazil, and then looking at other marketplaces like Colombia and Argentina beyond that. Right. How about the platforms there? Is it just like Amazon or are there other things or platforms that you sell on? Each country has its own platforms. So uh, in Mexico, Amazon and Mercado Libre are the two largest. Amazon's actually the, uh, I think it overtook uh, Mercado Libre in total number of sales. But from a fulfillment standpoint, Mercado Libre's fulfillment network is the largest fulfillment network in Latin America. So last mile delivery uh, with Mercado Libre is miles ahead of Amazon, unfortunately. Um, in Brazil, you're looking at other marketplaces. The three largest marketplaces are uh, Casa Bahia, Lojas Americanas, and then Amazon. So Amazon is significantly smaller than two other uh, platforms in Brazil. And Brazilian e-commerce is a little bit further ahead. Uh, there's other stores and retailers that are more advanced than what you'll find in Mexico. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to compete in Brazil. Um, so again, Mexico is usually a good spot to start with. That uh, makes sense. And I guess since Amazon isn't necessarily dominant in those markets, like how, how big would you estimate is the total, like, I guess, digital retail space since Amazon's 50%, which I think is like 175 billion. Mm -hmm. Are those other marketplaces like 60, 70% in like Brazil and Colombia or how does that work? The, um, I, I don't remember the exact numbers for Brazil, but I believe Amazon's about 17% of total online sales in Brazil. Uh, the other two platforms are significantly higher and Brazil is a larger market uh, than Mexico. So uh, when we look at that, the number of sales that are happening on other platforms outside of Amazon in Brazil is much higher than the sales that are happening on Amazon. Uh, same in, in Mexico. Uh, the plat Like I said, the platforms are similar. I think uh, it's about a little bit less than 50 50 split between the two um but there's still a significant number of sales happening uh, on mercado libre and it's worthwhile paying attention to so uh again the overall sales volume is split between the two countries brazil is larger than mexico uh and in mexico uh in both countries mercado libre is one of the leading platforms that you should be focusing on that's interesting because that's like Number one, like an extra 100 billion at least in GMV it wasn't accounted for in the initial figure. And the second thing is I don't really know that many Amazon sellers selling on Mercado Libre or any of the other platforms. Most of them are in Amazon Mexico and it's like one, two or three percent of their sales. So it's pretty interesting. I guess then how would they think about like a Latin America launch? Like how do they assess whether or not it's worth it for them based on like their current size and potential revenue? There's a lot of demand for certain categories over other categories, and those are the ones that would probably be the best fit for, for considering Latin America. So uh, we work pretty closely with Mercado Libre and uh, Amazon to see what product categories they're trying to get in. And typically electronics, supplements, food, uh, baby products, and pet supplies are the main categories that they are really focused on bringing more companies into Latin America for. Um, that being said, the sales volume, as you mentioned, is smaller than the US, uh, but it's still pretty significant. We've taken some brands uh, into Mexico where they immediately start seeing 10 to $15,000 a month in sales, others where it goes a little bit slower. 
Um, the interesting challenge with launching in Latin America is the differences between how the platforms work. So Mercado Libre is very different than Amazon. Amazon is very, if we think about how products are ranked on the platform, it's very much focused on the ASIN level of each product. So each product has its own indexing factors that go into it. On Mercado Libre, it's about the seller. So essentially the equivalent in the US, uh, sorry, in Amazon would be having more seller feedback or better seller feedback. The more seller feedback you have on Mercado Libre, the more visible your products are gonna be and the more uh, sales you're gonna get. You actually can see on Mercado Libre how many units or how many products uh, a seller has sold over the last 90 days on the platform. So it, it's a very big difference in, in mentality when you need to focus on the time to start growing over time. The more sales you're gonna get as a seller on Mercado Libre, the more visibility you're gonna get. And I think a lot of people get frustrated with that. Um, especially because you know, they might not initially start getting a lot of sales without running advertising or some other marketing promotions to drive traffic to Mercado Libre. So um, that being said, obviously focusing on Brazil is the, uh, sorry, on uh, Amazon in Mexico and Brazil is the first place to start because it's going to be the most similar to what you're used to in the US or in other markets. And then from there, building over time on Mercado Libre is, is how you can keep growing and launching in, in uh, Latin America. And how um, relevant, I guess, is ASP in this equation? Because obviously incomes in Latin America are lower. So are like certain ASP ranges not really going to work well there? Or like if someone's selling a more premium product, is, not, is that not going to get that much demand? No. It, conversion rates? Uh, it's difficult to give you a, an exact answer on that. But in general, the, the customers that are shopping on Amazon have more or you know, any online platform in Latin America have more disposable income than others. Um, the price points also don't tend to matter as much because they are used to paying higher prices. For example, uh, VAT in Mexico is 16%. Products that come in from uh, other countries into Brazil have a 50% tax on them. Even local uh, manufacturing taxes come close to 50% in Brazil. So customers are typically accustomed to paying more for products online. Uh, so it doesn't actually have that much of a significant uh, effect on conversion rate. If a customer wants a product, they're going to get the product knowing that the price is higher than they might pay, pay you know, or they might see advertised on other platforms. And I think that's uh, one of the interesting things about, about Latin America is that uh, the because of taxes, because of protectionism, you're, the customers are already accustomed to knowing that it's going to cost me a little bit more to get a product in. But if, if I sell um, through like a Mexican company or like a Brazilian company that I own, do I bypass some of these like import fees or does it not work like that? There's, it, again, it's going to be different for, for every country. Uh, we can help you know estimate what the fees are going to be. And we have an entire team that's dedicated to that. Uh, in Brazil, there is a potential way to get around it. And, and in Mexico as well. Uh, Brazil has... Uh, export uh, free export zones uh, where you could potentially warehouse your inventory and you only pay as the units come through. Uh, so as uh, you go to fulfill an order from the free export zone to a consumer is when you would pay the taxes. Mexico and the US have a similar agreement. Uh, warehouses along the border, uh, you can import the inventory into the warehouses and not pay import taxes until the orders are fulfilled to the end consumer. So uh, there's not really a way to bypass them per se, there's a way to reduce the amount of taxes that you're paying up front versus paying over time as you sell through the inventory. Is there a way to like, I guess, estimate in a way that's relatively accurate um, how much revenue you're going to do by country or by marketplace? Or I guess, how do you go about like figuring out what the potential is like? It depends. It really depends on categories. It really depends on uh, what your products are. So for example, a lot of our supplement clients are doing $30,000, $40,000 a month in Amazon and Mexico. Um, other clients are doing similar numbers uh, in the pet and the baby product categories. Uh, electronics is the one that's a little bit more tricky, uh, mainly because there are a lot of restrictions in Latin America about bringing electronics directly from China. Um, so US or foreign brands that are manufacturing electronics not in China have a competitive advantage in Latin America when it actually comes to selling. Uh, and because of that, you know, you can see some pretty significant numbers there as well. Right, what are some categories then that usually don't work? That don't work? Yeah, don't work. Um, typically, I, I focus more 
or my recommendations are usually focusing more on consumable products. So again, supplements, uh, food, uh, beauty products, cosmetics, uh, pet supplies, baby, baby products. Those are typically the, the products that are going to ha- see the best return from investing in Latin America. If you have a product that's not consumable, if a customer is just buying it one time, you will see success, but uh, mainly because the, the cost per clicks and the advertising costs are significantly lower. Um, but in the long term, it's it's you know it's the same challenge you're running in the U.S. is how do you continue to scale efficiently without you know blowing through your advertising budgets? Right, and I guess how do you forecast budgets and inventory for like a Latin America launch? Uh, typically, what we see from a, a spend standpoint or a cost per click uh, standpoint is the costs are about one tenth. Uh, of what they are in the U.S. So your advertising budgets can be significantly smaller to achieve the same reach and results or similar reach and results. Um, inventory wise, we typically recommend starting with at least a thousand units. Uh, so launching from that standpoint, obviously the, the cost and that's going to be different for everyone, but at least a thousand units is going to give you enough inventory to test different marketplaces, test different advertising strategies and different uh, content strategies on the platforms to see what works for you. Actually, in terms of like PPC, that is like my ACOS one tenth of what it would be in the US. So the average US ACOS is 30%. Am I getting like 3% in Mexico or how does that work? Uh, in all in transparency, most of our clients are operating at less than a 10% ACOS uh, on the Amazon platform. So it, it's a pretty great return on your advertising. Uh, and from a taco standpoint, that's, that's even a better number. Uh, we have some clients that are under 1% on tacos. So uh, Advertising is pretty cheap. It's still cheap for now. It's only going to get more competitive as the market continues to grow and more brands come into it. Uh, but it's a great opportunity right now for brands to get started and starting positioning themselves for growth in the long term. Right. What else is different about the PPC? Because I assume like search volumes are pretty different, so it might be harder to scale up your advertising. A lot of the keywords I assume would be in Spanish, so maybe mm-hmm. that would create some difficulties if you don't actually know the language during keyword research. What else yeah. is different? Yeah, I mean, obviously, language is going to be different. Local localization of both your content on the listing and the advertising campaigns is going to be important. So, working with uh, a local provider on that will help. Um, ad placements are more or less the same uh, from as the U.S. Uh, DSP is also available in in Mexico and Latin America, which is another great opportunity for a lot of brands. Um, the main differences are really going to come around the the cost per advertising and the efficiency. The advertisers in Mexico are not as sophisticated as what we see in the U.S. So a lot of ad strategies that maybe have worked for you in the past might actually do pretty well down here. All right. So what what mistakes, I guess, should most people avoid during the Latin America launch or things they wouldn't consider? The, the biggest mistakes that we see is people trying to cut corners or trying to find shortcuts around this. When I said that starting a business and dealing with some of the challenges down here are difficult, they're necessary as well. So for example, we've had a lot of clients that have found shortcuts by using a 3PL to import products. Uh, But when you don't have a tax ID in Mexico and to have a tax ID, you need to have a business in Mexico. Amazon will take 20% of your sales as income tax and they won't remit it to you. So they'll hold on to that. We had a couple clients that got hit with fifty, sixty thousand dollar bills for sales tax that was not uh, collected by Amazon as well. So there's another risk there. Those are the two of the common uh, challenges we've seen. Uh, making sure you don't have the right uh, approvals or compliance for the importation is another one. We've had clients that tried to shortcut things and had product get caught at customs and, and pretty much stuck in customs for ex- extended periods of time, and so we were able to resolve it for them. So. Those are the main cut, the main issues. If you're going to do it, you need to make sure you're doing it the right way. If you try to cut corners, you're going to run into a lot of headaches. Right, and this other question wasn't really on our agenda, but it's just out of my own personal like curiosity. You uh-huh. mentioned your team is Mexico based. Are you like finding and hiring Amazon PPC specialists in Mexico, or are these other like origin U.S. based people who made the move? When it comes to, uh, I mean, we have our team distributed across the globe. Uh, We have a lot of team members here in Mexico, but we also have team members in Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, uh, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, uh, as well as a lot of other foreign countries like India, Pakistan, 
Thailand, uh, Germany, Romania. When it comes to advertising specific, most of our team is not in Latin America. Uh, we have a few advertisers in Latin America to help with the Spanish side, uh, as well as a team of account managers that are Spanish speaking to make sure that things uh, line up well or are written correctly and show up well on the platform. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when it comes to hiring, there's a lot of good people that have advertising talent, maybe not necessarily on the Amazon platform, uh, but they may have ad, ad experience in Google and a lot of other areas. Yeah, I've also been hiring out of several countries. So I've hired out of Pakistan, India, Philippines, and Canada, where we're based. And um, I guess there are differences in performance between each country, at least from the candidate pool that I've observed. So do you have like more success with any one of these countries? And I guess, where is it easier to recruit for you? Um, I mean, we've had success with a variety of countries. The ones we've actually had the least success with has been the Philippines, uh, surprisingly. Uh, we have some great team members from the Philippines, but they are more for like virtual assistant tasks or executive assistant tasks than actual client operations. Uh, for us, when it comes to advertising, we've seen really good success with India and Pakistan. Uh, when it comes to client relationship management for us, since the majority of our clients are, are North American based, uh, teams in Latin America have been really good there because the, especially in Mexico, because the level of English is really high, uh, and the proximity with time zones and everything else. So it, we see a variety of success in different areas. Right. I'd say I've seen the same, the same thing with like India and Pakistan, especially since I think like 90% of the Amazon PPC candidate pool is in both of those countries, yeah. statistically speaking, assuming every single country performs at the same level, the vast majority of like good Amazon PPC fans has to be in India and Pakistan, just because most Amazon PPC experts are there. There are like hundreds of thousands of people there, even for like yeah. the posts that I make, the jobs that I post. You know, everything like 99% of applicants are usually from those two countries yeah. with the other 1% being divided between the Philippines and maybe North America. So yeah, I just think like statistically speaking, the best people have to be there. Yeah, I would say there in Eastern Europe is another great place to look for talent as well. Uh, they're all, the level of English is also usually pretty high and a lot of them have experience on the marketing side already. So uh, we've been able to find some good people over there as well. Right. Where are you sourcing these candidates? I'm actually hiring right now. So this is like a self serving question, but where do you source these candidates? Mostly from LinkedIn and Indeed. Those are the two platforms that we use. Right. Are you going like outbound or are you just posting jobs and waiting for everyone to come in? Uh, both. Uh, we have a pretty good reach on our, our LinkedIn business page, as well as we go out and look for candidates that we think are a good fit for the roles, the roles that we have open. And on the Indeed side, it's all, uh, it's all paid ads. Uh, so we all have the inbound from there. Right. And I guess, what would your advice be for like a seller? Because sellers have like a disadvantage when it comes to this, because, you know, as an agency owner, as like a software provider, like I am, like we get to interview like hundreds and hundreds of candidates and we end up hiring dozens of people. So we got a lot more practice than the average seller would. We'd only ever hire like one, two, three or four PPC specialists like throughout their entire career. So what advice would you have for like finding the right person, filtering through resumes and maybe the interview process. Ooh, that's really tough. Um, obviously, uh, the first thing you need to look for is the right experience. Uh, Amazon is continuing to become uh, more developing skills. So more and more people are being uh, accustomed to the platform. But if you're unable to find that second, then for me, the next best experience is people with Google ads, uh, because it's also keyword based and somewhat, somewhat similarly related. Um, Prior experience at ad agencies, I think, is another great tool because they had, understand structure. They understand uh, how things work within an agency environment. A lot of times when you end up with freelancers, they kind of do their own thing and there's no real structure. There's no real rhyme or reason to it. And they can't really explain things to you or, or follow a structure that you need them to do. So I would look for those two things from candidates. And then when it comes to actually screening them and interviewing them, uh, lots of questions around how... Uh, we use a lot of hypothetical situations on how they would deal with the situation. Uh, so for example, if I'm trying to achieve this goal, how would you set things up to get me there? Or I'm having this problem, what steps would you go through to resolve this problem? Those are typically good ways that uh, we help screen candidates. Right. Do you have like a favorite interview question? I've been testing like a few interesting ones maybe that I'm going to discuss with you after you tell me. 
I think my favorite interview question is uh, really about like what their long-term goals are. Cause I think that tells you a lot about a person. If they don't have ambition to, you know, either rise within their career or grow within their career or potentially even start a new business, they are probably just going to be content and they're not going to continue to improve, continue to try to get better at what they're doing. I prefer candidates that lean more towards the self-improvement side, the self-learning side and trying to grow their skill set. Right. I've, I've been testing some interesting questions. So usually when I post a job, I got like 150, 200 applicants. A lot of them look the exact same. So it's difficult to kind of sort through them and I can't do 200 <laughs> interviews either just because that's like 200 hours of work that you know, I might have spent doing something else. So I started asking a few questions actually and I've replaced the resume entirely from my screening, uh, screening process. So with my latest like hiring attempt, what I've done is I posted a job. I just said like, hey, I don't want to see your resume. I just want to know one of two things. Either you share with me something interesting that you've learned about Amazon ads recently, yeah. or you share like a controversial or, or like contrarian opinion that you have about Amazon ads. And essentially what I'm trying to screen for is like, number one, are they actually improving themselves? So if someone's only able to name something very basic that they've learned, either number one, they haven't learned anything at all, or number two, they're a beginner. And unless I'm trying to hire a beginner or like a junior role, that's not something that I want. So like a bad response, these are actual responses that I've gotten. Like a bad response would be something like, um, I've learned that, you know, optimizing your bids regularly is crucial for maintaining a good ACOS. Right? Like I know either that guy hasn't learned anything for the past five years, <laughs> right? he just made up the whole five year experience thing, or he's just not like self teaching or not learning anything at all. Yeah. Right. Or they're just like a beginner. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is if they are contrarian opinion, isn't very contrarian. Then again, like I'm just looking for someone that's able to develop their own ideas and their own thoughts about Amazon ads and um, someone that's, I guess, gone like so in depth into this topic that they're able to notice things that most people wouldn't agree with or most people wouldn't notice. It's like, I guess, how I filter for clear thinking. And I think it provides actually more context or more like information than you just get from a resume because a lot of people hire bad like ppc specialists and one mistake i made early on in like my entrepreneurship journey is like hiring for logos so i'd go to this super big agency and i'd hire someone from there like you know what's good enough for this guy or good enough for this company must be good enough for me and i just ended up with a bunch of you know really really bad people really underperforming employees and i had to let all of them go i just developed my own process for screening along the way. And another question that I've incorporated recently is something like, um, estimate this is from my last hiring attempt. I'm almost closing it on like end of the track now, actually. So I think I'm going to share a full set, like, case study on my LinkedIn uh, once I'm done with that. But my other question was like, estimate how many organic clicks happened on the 1st of August on Amazon US alone, right? And I, <laughs> Like 95% of people are like, say, if I can't find any publicly available data for this, like, how do I figure that out? And that 5% gets split up into like a 4% and a 1% group. That 4% just makes something up. Like, you know, they just find some statistic on the internet, like Amazon gets 70 or 80 million daily visitors. And, uh, you know, I just assume that the average person makes 10 clicks per visit. And I'll just assume again that the average click or the like 50% of clicks are organic. So therefore the number of organic clicks per day must be 400 million, right? So that's one way Then that 1%, I'm not going to reveal like the final answer, at least what I've came up with, just because I'm still like trying to hire for this position. I plan on using this question again, but that one person out of a hundred is able to actually tie it back to like Amazon's revenue figures, Amazon's advertising spend, like total on the actual platform, you know, average CPC that on, they're actually able to infer from that big number, like what the actual total organic clicks are per day. So I'm just screening for clear thought. I'm screening for, you know, someone that's able to learn fast because I started working when I was nine years old. It's a story that I plan to tell sometime on this podcast, but I started working when I was nine. So you end up learning that like the young and experienced person who's willing to work super hard is or is capable at least of outdoing the person that maybe has like five, six, seven, eight years of experience that wakes up every single day and hates their job. 
So I'm just looking for someone smart and I just think over time smart people and hardworking people and people who actually like what they do are going to win every single time. So that's like my own theory for hiring. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, hiring people that are able to think for themselves and are critical thinkers is extremely important. And that is a good way. It actually reminds me of some of the the interviews I did out of college when I was looking for jobs. Uh, I, w- I interviewed at a few research firms, a few consulting firms, and a lot of them are critical thinking questions like that to see what your thought process is and you know how you come to the end end result. And I think that is uh, that is a very important skill as well. Perfect, perfect. All right then, thank you for coming on. Where can our listeners find out more about you? So Eve, thanks for having me. Uh, the best way to find out more about myself, my companies is either go to aimsadvisors.com or goavans.com. Uh, either one of those websites, we can help talk to you about expanding to Latin America. Or if you want to contact me directly, my email is mike at amzadvisors.com. And I'll be glad to you know, find some time to chat and see if we, your brand can be the right fit for getting into Latin America. Great. Thank you. Thank you again.